Discussions in Depth Psychology is powered by Pacifica Graduate Institute. Your host is Bonnie Bright. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Discussions in Depth Psychology, which is powered by Pacifica Graduate Institute. My name is Bonnie Bright, and I'm your host, and I'm a graduate of Pacifica's program in Depth Psychology, and this series is dedicated to bringing to light some of the really interesting information and people who are doing work in depth psychology. I'm here today with Daphne Dodson, who is researching and writing about an absolutely fascinating topic. We'll be talking today about tending memory, engaging memory as a living image. Daphne, thanks so much for being with me today. It's delightful to be here. Thanks, Bonnie. Well, I'm really excited to talk about memory tending because this is something that engages my imagination immediately when I hear the word. Let me read the bio for Daphne so that everybody knows a little bit more about her and then we'll jump in. Daphne Dodson, PhD, is a global qualitative research psychologist primarily conducting studies in the fields of infectious and autoimmune diseases. And her specific areas of interest include cultural psychology, the imagination, and memory. And of course, we will be talking about tending memory, engaging memory as living image. So Daphne, why don't you start off by telling us about how you came to the idea of actually tending a memory? Tending it really sounds like something very special. I always noticed that my daughter, who's now a freshman at college, she would have very different perspectives of her memories that were the same lived experience that I had had being her mom. And I always found it fascinating, just as in general, that she could remember things that I didn't or seem to experience things that I didn't recall happening. And I never held it in question that, that I was right or she was right or the other person was wrong. But just was fascinated by the idea that we could have these different perspectives of what had happened. And I'm a qualitative researcher by profession, and so I spent the last 20 years interviewing people. I think part of the things that I'm trying to understand is who they are, who, who they're thinking about their self is, and how it's impacted by their life. And I found that a lot of times when I would ask people about their current circumstances, they would go back to memory to help me understand who they currently were. And the way that they would do that is they would paint a picture for me oftentimes of something or some things that they had lived through. And I found that fascinating. And I remember having a lunch during residential at Pacifica with Glenn Slater and speaking to him about this possible idea I was having that could memories actually be something that were an image? Could they be an image? And could they, could they be similar to the same kind of images we have when we experience our dreams? Would that be a possibility? So Glenn and I just kind of engaged in this conversation of what that might look like. And that was probably three years ago. And it started the interest in it. It's so interesting because, of course, in depth psychology, we talk a lot about images and the power of images and how we can actually engage with them in relationship. And they, as you say, they become living images. So that is something that I believe once we start looking at it in some detail or from a multitude of perspectives, it just opens up a huge range of possibilities for ways to work with it, ways to actually enter more fully into memory. Let's start talking about the value of digging into memories of images. What, what can that do for a person? Well, I think once we get past the idea, and I, I use the term get past, not to say that it, it's not grounded and doesn't have meaning to it, but get past the idea that our memories are fixed. They really open up the ability for us to look at our memories as uh, tools for us in terms of understanding our own self and who we currently are and, and where might we be going psychologically. And so I think that there's some just beautiful openness when we think of memory as image in that we come to understand or accept or think about or be open to the idea that our memories don't have to be right or wrong, binary, fixed places of true or false. And this isn't my idea. There's a lot of literature out there that, that really supports this idea, from neuroscientists to cognitive behavioral therapists to depth psychologists. This is not a new idea. Although, interestingly enough, I certainly met resistance, even among many of that my peer depth psychologists, that there was a resistance to even thinking of memory as image because we open up the idea that then the memory is mutable, the memory shifts, and it shifts along with who we are in our current space of life, how we're seeing ourselves, how we're growing, what we're experiencing now. But as we know, if we're open to that possibility, those shifts can be very meaningful to understanding what's happening to ourselves and why we're seeing our memory the way it, the way it is. 
at the simplest level, too, it sort of allows an acceptance that you and I can have the same lived experience but have a different memory of it. And our memory image then becomes the space of, of our own psychic material, our own psychology and what we can work with and understand. So I think that at a very basic level, it allows a lot of openness in, in, towards where we are and where we're going. But you also asked, I think it's totally appropriate, like the beauty of looking at a memory of, as an image. An image here, I, I'm using it in a very open way. Definitely it, it's the vividness, it's the picturesque mind, mental map image in our mind. But sometimes it's the sound or we can have a memory image of the smell. So it can be many senses. To experience it in that way, I think it's a very inviting way to just engage back with the things of the past or the way we're seeing the things of the past. And, of course, uh, not all of our memories are always good ones, as we both know. <laughs> and I think that what, what you're sure. saying actually makes me look at or regard memory as a thing that can evolve on some level. So mm -hmm. if you start to look at the way that the individuation process works, as Jung spoke about it, we're constantly kind of circumambulating a, a topic or a theme in our lives. And, and hopefully the idea is that each time we come around that topic or that theme once again, that we can and make some kind of changes, integrate more of uh, the work that needs to be done around it, and then improve the situation, integrate it more, make ourselves more whole through it, and then we go around the circle and then we come back around and re-engage again. From my perspective, I'm wondering if it's actually not a good thing that memories might be able to evolve, and perhaps that's at least part of what you mean when you talk about a living image, because we, as we mm -hmm. enter into a relationship with them, they begin to change, but we also begin to change. Well, I think I want to clarify first, Bonnie, because that's a great question, and I think at the heart of your question is where I, I met some resistance and sensitivity about this idea that our memories are mutable. I actually do mean that our memories can change, but what I don't mean is that the original event changed. The hard mm -hmm. part is we certainly don't have a recording for all our original events, although I think, you know, technologically we're getting more and we're getting more and more into that space. But our memories can shift, and, and I, I believe this, and there, again, I'm not, this isn't just what I'm suggesting, but a lot of, there's a lot of data that backs this up. We can shift in the way that we see ourselves simply by where we currently are in life. And so we might remember a memory in a way that at, at certain points of our life makes, make us feel more vulnerable and other points in our life make us feel more confident just, think, just simply from where we're sitting. And like you mentioned, not all of our memories are good. That's very true. But if we see a memory of original events as an image and then we're able to step into it as an image, even of the negative memories of the things that haunt us in a negative way, we can work with them and possibly reshape our relationship to that memory itself and therefore to that past self and maybe the others who were in that memory. A mini case study of someone who had that might help explain a little bit. This particular person who was part of my sample had a memory of leaving an abusive relationship many years ago. The man in it who was her fiance, in her own words, haunted her even though she had left him and they had never again made physical contact with each other after the point she left him. But she had tried to leave him before and was never able to except for the instance in which she did leave him. That memory we worked with, and she told me the memory exactly as she recalled it as having happened these many years ago. When we entered back into it as a memory image and tended to it, in short, and it was a beautiful experience that lasted many hours, but in short, it gave her, in part, the opportunity for her to actually bring closure, which she was never able to do by the way of saying to this person, I'm leaving you. And so she never felt the opportunity to just simply work through that material, that psychic material of having escaped but never having mm -hmm. had closure. And there's, again, some data that suggests when we're a survivor, we hold residual trauma of the things that we survive. The process of surviving itself can be traumatic. And so for this woman, mm -hmm. her ability to work with it as a memory image, and, and it came to her and she moved through it very fluidly in, in the imagination, working with it imaginally, she was able to engage the memory image of leaving and being in that space she left and also with you know, the image of this person who was her abuser and saying goodbye to him and saying, I'm leaving you, and actually then leaving. 
And it gave her the opportunity to finally bring closure to it so that this 10-year-long haunting would hopefully end. And she's doing well. Now, I didn't have a longitudinal study, meaning we're not talking years and years, but the hope would be that Hattie gave her the opportunity to bring closure to that memory so that the memory doesn't continue to haunt. Yeah, and of course there are always adverse effects when we are under the influence of some of these kinds of negative effects of memories that are very traumatic or difficult for us to integrate. So I can see a huge amount of value in being able to work with a memory in that way. I can also see that this would be really valuable for individuals because all of us, of course, have (laughs) memories of one kind or another that, that either need to be worked with so that we can get some kind of clearing psychologically and be able to make space for new things to happen in our lives, but also uh, maybe even to work with positive memories in a way that can further enhance the benefits on so many different levels. Do you foresee yourself moving forward? I mean, I can really perceive a way in which this can become an individual kind of practice where someone can serve as a coach or a mentor to help somebody do memory tending to get mm-hmm. exactly these same kinds of benefits. Do you foresee doing that yourself as a career, or is that something that you've thought about as a possibility for others to actually engage in? Well, it's a great question. I certainly am open to doing it with other people. I'm not a clinical psychologist. I'm not a licensed therapist. But one of the things that I would like to see happen is to have this practice be available to therapists, be available to clinical and counseling psychologists, so that perhaps they can use it as a tool. One person who was one of my participants is a clinical psychologist who actually practices EMDR with her patients, which is eye movement disassociation reprocessing. And it's basically a way of emotional integration of a traumatic memory. And she has been using the work that we did together in memory tinning along with EMDR since we have been doing it to deepen it. So the EMDR begins the process of allowing us to integrate the emotion into the body, and then the memory tinning allows us then to work with it imaginally and deepens the EMDR experience. So I think, Bonnie, that's a big place where I would like to see it potentially be used more is getting it out into the community of therapists, of psychologists, but also just in a lay community because it doesn't necessarily have to be worked with, as you said, with traumatic memories. It can be worked with very happy memories. In fact, this woman herself, she was pulled back and tended a memory. And when I say pulled back, the memory sort of chooses itself to be tended she came into a space of life for her that was very fulfilling, but it was a major change in her life. And she now, 20-some years later, is also experiencing a major change in life. And she realized through spending memory-tending time and being in the presence of those memories that a lot of the ability to move through some difficult material she's now experiencing, she's done some similar work in her life, and she has her own self to rely on. And so making that connection back to a younger self has really supported her movement forward and making it through the difficulties she's now facing. So I think Mm -hmm. there's a lot of possibility with it, yes. Yeah, a lot of possibilities are occurring to me even as you speak, even the idea of future tending, which is an entirely different topic and we we won't go there. But (laughs) but yeah, coming into the relationship with this is so valuable. And I like that you said that the memories can choose us because that to Mm -hmm. me speaks very strongly for an objective psyche in which we are moving all the time and which has our best interest at heart and and Mm -hmm. also speaks to that inner healer that's within us that knows what needs to be worked and wishes to come into relationship with us and presents itself to us. So I think that's really powerful. One thing that's occurring to me as I listen to you talk about this and just consider the implications is how also very powerful this could potentially be to do collective work at the level of the culture. Because as you know, and and we all see every single day, there's so much going on in our culture that's so overwhelming. And however, it's not always just the current events that are the problem, but uh, there's a lot of disenfranchised trauma that has occurred because of colonization, particularly if you're in some of the new world, quote unquote, countries. And there's also a lot of events that have just happened that are related to land and place 
where mm-hmm. people talk about the land remembering and going mm-hmm. there and, and being able to engage with that. Can you see applications or what are your thoughts about possibly using something like memory tending to engage for the collective as well? It's such a great question, Dr. Dylan Trigg, who's written a lot on place memory as well as body memory, was asking the same question, seeing the same possibility of can this be a group tending experience. And I think it definitely could be. I think that it could be very meaningful. It's interesting, though, I've never seen dream tending, which is where the original idea came from, the idea of working with our dreams in an imaginal way, working through them of our personal associations and then moving on to them in a more of a transpersonal way of amplification, as you're aware of, and then moving into the imaginal and allowing the images themselves to be considered living images, that they have their own wisdom. I've only seen that experience at an individual level. However, I've also seen an experience where while someone working or tending to a dream, many of the other people in the presence of that are affected by the dream. It's it's like you're getting caught in in the psyche. You know, you're there among the psyche and it's not just an individual experience anymore. So it seems like, yes, if if the intention was made to have it be something that was more of a community-based approach and practice, and then you're centering it in a space, you're adding to the psyche the psyche of place. It seems like it could be a very valuable and potentially meaningful experience to a collective group, even if perhaps a few people are in the practice, but it's a meaningful practice to something other than themselves, which in your case, you're bringing up the land, the the memories of the land, the memories that the land itself holds. It's fascinating. I don't know is the uh, is the honest answer because it's not something that I worked with, but it's an opening. It's a it's a next step perhaps, and it's very intriguing. Yeah, I think it is too. And of course, you brought up dream tending, which was developed by Stephen Eisenstadt probably 30 or 40 years ago now, and has been around for a long time. And you're right, is typically known as more of an individual process where people work one on one. But I'm also aware and thinking about the fact that you talked about big dreams. And mm-hmm. those big dreams often can be viewed as, you know, of course, sometimes very critical for the individual who has them and pertinent to their own life. But sometimes those big dreams can also be viewed as collective dreams, meaning that the dream was not given to someone just because of them individually, but it was actually given to them as a dream for the culture. And um, even a lot of indigenous and earth-based peoples viewed dreams this way, and they would often gather in the morning and talk about mm-hmm. what the big dreams or those collective dreams were so that they knew which direction to go with the the tribe itself. And so all of this to say that I guess I'm disagreeing with you that I think that there's a lot of potential with the idea here of being able to come Mm -hmm. together in groups. And so either individually or as groups, it just seems like a really powerful modality. And I like the fact that you're suggesting that it could be kind of layered on to what clinical psychologists or therapists are already doing to, to have a real powerful benefit to people. Absolutely. And, you know, it's it's interesting what you were saying, and as you were speaking, it made me think of another one of the people who worked with a memory, and it was a memory of her father's passing. And though she had never thought that the reason that the memory of her father's passing came up for her was, was the intention of this, it ended up being an opportunity for her to see the need for herself as her, as well as her family and especially as well as her estranged brother to start the work of bringing this estranged brother back into the fold of the family. And so right there you have a moment of one individual working through her memory, and yet it, it, it implies that it has some powerful reach. Even if we just look at the community of a family, it has some powerful reach into that family. And that family, I mean, the brother has a family, and the, the woman who I worked with has a family. And so we start to broaden the reach out. I think whenever any one of us is open to and willing to engage in our own personal psychological work or the work of the land or the work of the greater world and the greater psyche, it has outreach, it has opportunity for the greater psychology, the greater soul to Anima Mundi to be impacted by it. So I'm I'm excited just even talking about it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I, I just think it has a lot of potential. So I feel that same excitement, which means there's definitely something there, which is really powerful. Yeah, that's great. But I wonder, are, are there some challenges that you foresee with it? I mean, what kinds of issues might people run into through the, the process itself? Is there anything that could potentially be a downside? 
Well, I think so. And I, it's funny, Bonnie, I think you've raised, at least for me, the two that came out most profoundly, one of them being this idea that somehow it's perceived that memory tending, seeing a memory as mutable and working with it as a living image then somehow negates the original event. And that's never the intention. It's never to say, well, that, well, the event itself didn't happen the way you remember it or the memory has changed, and therefore if the memory changed, that must mean that the original event wasn't how it was. That's not the intention, and I think we have to be very careful in really clarifying that so that people don't walk away with a sense of, like, doubting themselves, doubting their own makeup of of lived experience. Whether or not the original event happened precisely as they now remember it does not change in any way the importance of that original event in shaping who they are. And so I think that's a really important caveat to be made with all of it. That's one challenge I see, the ethics of it, I guess. The second part, which is also an ethical point of view, but um, maybe a little different, is that, well, I'll, I'll borrow again from the woman I explained who had the opportunity to finally bring closure to saying goodbye and saying I'm leaving you to this abusive relationship that memory tending work actually triggered her to move back into a fight flight pattern. The beauty was she had done so much work that she recognized it. She recognized that she was starting to feel that fight flight that it had triggered. And she caught herself before moving into what was traditionally a flight pattern. And so I think it's being careful too with those traumatic memories and how quickly we move through them and towards them. Memory tending, I don't think can be taken lightly is the, um, mm-hmm. the, the real caveat there. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right, particularly because a lot of the memories that obviously will come up for tending will be ones that are associated with trauma. So you're pointing to a real need for a container and for people yeah. that are very intentional and cautious about the way that they establish a container in which people can actually do the work. So it seems like a clinical setting and by people who are highly trained as therapists or in a therapeutic process would probably be ideal in this kind of situation. It's it's almost like that, you know, you don't want to say don't try this at home, but on the other hand, (laughs) even Jung, during the the period of the red years, when he was working the red years, talked a lot about how, you know, the the psyche can be completely overwhelmed by by some of these forces. They're so powerful. So it's, it's an important caveat. Absolutely. 100%. Thanks. Thanks for asking the question. Yeah, I think it's important to get it out there. And, and even, you know, I tend to get really excited about ideas, but, and we always need to make sure that we're looking at the whole picture. So I, I think that's a critical piece of it. You mentioned that this really has come up through your experience at Pacifica. And of course, you wrote about it for your dissertation. And you've done a lot of research and writing through the Pacifica process. How do you feel that your experience has been at Pacifica as far as supporting you in that process of learning and discovering and exploring this new, exciting topic? It's a great question. I feel warm inside hearing it and answering it. It's funny, in my acknowledgments, one of the acknowledgments that I made was to my, and I can't quote myself, I don't remember it exactly, but to my amazing, beautiful Pacifica professors who at the same time were teaching us academically, they were also nurturing souls. And I think that that's, that doesn't happen very often, that you can get both of those intensely valuable experiences. You can learn difficult material, you can be experiencing things on an academic and intellectual level, but all the while the important psychological opportunities are there for you, understanding yourself, understanding those around you, understanding the world itself, being aware of the souls of the world itself and and everything that you touch in the world. I think Pacifica holds that space. I think it's actually on some of the cutting edge, given my two children are at UNC Chapel Hill, and I, and I start to hear some of the things that are coming up for them. And then four years ago, I was hearing about them at Pacifica. But just starting to touch into that space of our Cartesian culture that is in some ways breaking, in many ways, breaking us down. And the space of saying, let's not call it wrong or bad, but let's be aware of it and what we can do with it. Pacifica holds that academic rigor But at the same time, it understands that these are human beings that are going through this program. And to your earlier words of memory tending, it itself creates that pit container for growth at an intellectual academic level, but most certainly at a soul and psychological level. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah, it's it's something that really is very unique in the world, and I can only corroborate that from my own experience at Pacifica. Uh, it's definitely a place where soul can happen if you 
want to look at it that way, and as well as yeah. being academically rigorous, which I personally really enjoy the balance. So it's been a, a very profound experience for me as well. Thank you so much, Daphne, for your time today. It's been just so fascinating, and it went all too quickly. I just want to remind everybody that Daphne Dodson is a global qualitative research psychologist, and she has been working on the topic of memory tending. And of course, Daphne, you have two new articles that are going to be published in the fall. It's very exciting. One of them is called Rebirthing Biblical Myth, the Poisonwood Bible as Visionary Art, and that will be in a book that's coming out through Rootledge, and the book is called Union Perspectives on Rebirth and Renewal, Phoenix Rising. So everybody can be on the lookout for that. And then the second one is an article called Saying Goodbye to Our Children, a Phenomenon of Soul Making, and that will be in the Psychological Perspectives Journal, which is also published by Rootledge and sponsored by the C.G. Jung Institute of Los Angeles. So congratulations on those. It's exciting to see your work starting to get published, and I'm going to be looking forward to seeing something on memory tending in the near future. Thank you, Bonnie, for having me. It was really delightful to talk with you about it. You've given me some great new ideas to think about as well. You've been listening to Discussions in Depth Psychology, powered by Pacifica Graduate Institute with host Bonnie Bright.